try to keep as quiet as possible to respect everyone here. Yeah. 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 If you haven't had the chance to sign yourself up to the mailing list, uh, please do so because we share a lot of content after this presentation. <laughs> You're going to notice that there's a lot of information that we're going to go through, so in order for you to digest it and also do your own research, then I encourage everyone, as I say, to put your email in the mailing list that is on the computer at the front. Uh, that way, in a couple of days, I can send the mailing list with all this content. So anyway, thank you. My, my name is Tomas. Uh, I'm the director of this community hub. Uh, we've been open since October. We're almost going to be a year now. And this is one of the events that we wanted to share with the community because we think it's an important thing whether you believe 5G is a good or a bad thing for humanity or for our community. It was really the responsibility of the telecommunications to inform the community and the population about what exactly this is. But we clearly seen them to promote it as uh, something we all want, we all need, because we need faster communications and, and then it just, we don't have any power to decide whether this, we want to continue with this. So, um, hey guys. So yeah, so that's one of the reasons that we felt like as a community, as one of you, we wanted to create this space so we can share a little bit of uh, the information we have researched. And most of the presenters tonight are local people that are also concerned. So yes, yeah, an invitation to keep an open mind and, and pay attention because uh, it's really interesting. All right, <laughs> so first thing first, keep calm and turn off your Wi-Fi, thank you so much. Uh, and this is something that I want to start with because, believe it or not, six out of ten people, they have no idea they're walking through life with these three icons on, meaning the mobile data on, the Wi-Fi, and the Bluetooth, whether you use an uh, iPhone or an Android. Of course, uh, you have to learn once you scroll down that if you're walking around with these three items on, you're exposing yourself, so, and the GPS as well, I forgot that one. You're exposing yourself to constantly be open to receive signal from an antenna. And this is important because we, we want to show you uh, that there are many antennas coming through this area and especially in Melbourne and in the world. So uh, there's a lot of people that I talk about this topic and they have no idea or awareness about these three things. And we're gonna learn today that both, all these items, they have different frequencies of radiation that it might concern to you because of potential health hazards. And um, yeah, so anyway, so I invite everyone, please, so you can turn off, or just if you don't want to be interrupted, which is something I do every night, that I learned to do it because I was also one of the people that I used to work with my Wi-Fi mobile data on all the time. And as a, you know, like as a normal human being, I used to just, whenever I had a chance, I just pull my phone out and then I just start scrolling down on social media. Uh, holding my phone down and then being unaware of this. So this is something that I've been trained or reprogrammed and mostly because uh, my wife Bella who's been instigating me to have conscious wireless habits. Um, so yeah, so that's good. This is not working, so I'm going to go like this. Yeah, so this is a free event. Uh, we only uh, ask for a gold donation coin just to pay for the space, the heating, and the advertising flyers and so on to just pass the message around. Uh, if the community hub uh, is a venue hire, we have multiple rooms for consultation rooms, for healers, for media rooms, for different sort of workshops. We run the farmer's market once a month, so if you haven't been to the farmer's market, this is an invitation for you to come and connect uh, every month, every third Saturday of the month with your local community and your local growers, which is great. 
Um, it's a great space where we get about 600 to 700 people every month. Um, yeah, and it's going like a mini festival, so quite alternative and just overall a great place. So if you are thinking in the future to organize your own event, uh, just come to talk to me after the, this event or anytime. Um, and I'm just going to go briefly through this because we have a few presenters tonight. And, but I want to start that uh, we didn't used to have these problems a hundred years ago or before the invention of radio frequencies per se. Uh, in fact, that's something that I love to start with is that the Earth has a vibration. It's been demonstrated and it's 7.83 hertz. That's the vibration of the Earth. It was called... Uh, and this was going by Schumann. So the Schumann resonance are a set of spectrum peaks in extremely low frequencies, portion of the Earth electromagnetic field spectrum. Schumann resonances are global electromagnetic resonance generated and excited by lighting discharge in the cavity formed by the Earth's surface and the ionosphere. So basically, we have a different set of frequencies that our Earth emits constantly. And I don't have an image here, but basically, this gets to an 85 kilometer radius. And the Earth, we're going to see that emits waves that are very long and very deep if you put it into a, a measuring device. And why is this important? I want to start like this because 5G is the completely opposite of that. Uh, we're going to take you through Richard, but he's going to go in detail to explain what exactly are the 5G waves and why they're so short and so narrow and pretty much 500 plus times that the Earth resonates, or even more. So it's an unnatural frequency. It's also an invisible frequency, same as the Earth, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And there's plenty of documentation and plenty of scientific evidence that you're going to have access to to validate the claims that uh, we've been criticizing about any wireless technology. There is an actual frequency transmitting from A to B, and that has an impact on the human being. So um, I first want to uh, introduce to uh, Richard. Uh, he's our first guest speaker. He came here last time. So Richard Cullen has a PhD in electrical engineering and a degree in physics. Uh, he's worked in IT for over 20 years, including telecom companies. He experienced first-hand EMF sensitivity. So he has spent many years doing his own re research on biological health, eff health effects and how to protect ourselves. He's been very active in the community, working with council members to stop the 5G rollout. So uh, please just give a round of applause. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Um, it's lovely to be back here again. Um, who was here the first time round? Okay, a lot of new faces. Uh, that's great. We, uh, we had a really good uh, session the first time out. And, uh, and that's the way these things go. Um, I've done, been doing a lot of research and I found out a whole bunch of uh, new information for myself, which uh, I'll be incorporating into what I've got to say. Uh, last time we talked primarily about the technology of 5G. I want to expand things a little bit, uh, partly because uh, Bella asked me to, but because it's also a very pertinent topic. You get to a point where you're going, but if we know all these health effects and we know all the, the side effects it can have, then how come it's allowed to happen? And that really gets into the safety standards. So uh, that's what I'm going to spend the second part of my uh, presentation talking about. I'm going to rattle through things at quite a pace, um, which I apologize about, but there's a lot to get through. But the slides are available online. I've shared them and I'll, I'll show you the link at the end so you can take a, a photo of that and go and have a look if you like. Um, so let's get into the technology side of things. 5G isn't one thing. 5G is a brand. It's a grab bag of a whole bunch of different technology uh, developments which are coming together in the next generation of, of mobile technology. Um, a lot of the technology developments that are becoming 5G are also being rolled into the evolution of 4G. So things like small cell, 
things like uh, the increased uh, frequency bands, um, the support for mobile devices, Internet of Things, that's all being brought into 4G as well as being pushed on 5G. It does beg the question, why do we even need 5G? But we'll leave that aside for the, for the time being. We're not, going to, uh, we're not going to cover every part on that screen, but because there's too much and we'd be here for hours looking at it. But one of the main questions about 5G is about millimetre waves, that is much higher frequencies that are going to be used for 5G. And while that's true that 5G can use higher and higher frequencies, um, it's not necessary. What we currently have, um, this is the electromagnetic spectrum, Radio frequency radiation is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, as are lights, uh, infrared, makes you nice and warm, ultraviolet apparently gives you cancer. Um, ultraviolet x-rays and gamma rays are also on the spectrum as well. Uh, but what we're talking about for uh, mobile device radiation is around about here. Um, it's in the uh, gigahertz range. It's technical stuff. If you haven't studied physics for the last few years, that's okay, but that's where we're talking about. It's a lot lower than infrared, which is where you feel the heat of the sun, um, but it's higher than uh, sort of long wave radio. Um, and we've got a lot of things already there. So we've got analog radio, we've got digital TV, we've got Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and 5G is going to be pushing the, the spectrum in that direction, okay? So this is a bit of a zoom in, and it shows that uh, current mobile uh, technologies are around about here on the spectrum, <coughs> about a gigahertz to about three and a half gigahertz. 5G is going to allow uh, to use to, to six gigahertz, and then higher into 24 to 100 gigahertz range. And that brings a whole bunch of technical challenges that haven't really been solved, but nonetheless, that's what's being, being talked about. One of the main problems with this is that it's fantastic from a uh, data transmission point of view because you can get a lot more data through if you're pushing into higher high frequencies. They aren't as heavily used by other things like uh, TV, TV stations. But the problem with this, and this is a diagram that shows the, the signal that gets lost as it goes through um, basically meat, which is what we are. As you go from does this thing point? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, let's try that. So as we go from 1 gigahertz to 5 gigahertz to 10 gigahertz, we lose signal as it passes through tissue. Okay? So if you want to transmit uh, a 10 gigahertz signal uh, and you have something like a block of meat in the way, it's not going to penetrate anywhere near as well as the 1 gigahertz or under. It ends up being much more about line of sight. And, uh, and that then has consequences, particularly that they need much more um, base stations rolled out because they need much more direct line of sight. Another thing that 5G brings with it is what's called beamforming. So a traditional mobile phone station has a, uh, it just spreads its signal out and radiates it over about that arc, 120 degrees and just sends a signal out, and it sits there and listens to what comes back. 5G, the smartphones that uh, develop 5G have realized that actually they can use multiple antennas together and direct a signal. And they can direct a signal at George, and they can direct a signal over here, and they can direct a signal over there, and they can be different signals. Okay, the same antenna uh, beaming three different signals at three different people. That's very clever. But the problem that we have is that it isn't just one beam. The way that um, signals combine, and, and if, if you did physics of school, you might have done um, uh, some, some wave experiments. And what you get are these bands of high radiation and bands of low radiation, high and low, and high and low. Um, Thomas, does this, will this play a, a YouTube clip? Yeah. If we're able to click on the, uh, let's just see. It's just 
just this um, this box in the corner is actually YouTube for that long time, so let's see if it works. So this is, yeah, just make that full screen. Yeah. So this is a numerical simulation. Let's go back to the beginning, because I'll have to explain this a little bit. But um, what this is, is we've got somebody walking along the street, and the antenna that's here, the green dot, is tracking this person and directing a beam straight at them. But what you can see is these side beams happening as well. And they're getting reflected off buildings. They're getting blocked by buildings. Here we've got a big shadow because the signal's not penetrating. And as the person walks along, we've got this whole street blanketed in radiation. That's what 5G is going to look like. That's how 5G is going to uh, going to be um, going to be impacting us. It isn't just that we have this laser-focused beam of light going straight at George and nobody else. No, we can direct it at George, but everybody else gets some as well, and then it reflects off the wall, and, and it's chaotic. What do you mean by tracking? Like, how does it track a person? You said it was tracking. Yes, it does. Because, because it's forming a beam, and it's directing the beam at you, as you move, it's able to, to look at the, the, the signal that's coming off your device, and figure out where you are, so and so it's like exactly because you're because it's a two-way communication. So will it still track you if you've got you know, your airplane off? If you've got your airplane off and you're not using 5G, it doesn't care about you. It doesn't direct anything at you. Okay. Could you explain who would want to track all the it's not, this isn't about tracking in terms of the intelligence agencies. This is, just, this is just in terms of directing the focus of the signal at you. Okay, so I understand, and that's something I'm not going to get into in terms of security and tracking us as individuals. That is a different matter. This is about tracking you as a mobile device. So what happens if I'm walking down the street with my phone off and you walking in front of me with his phone on. Exactly. This is the problem, right? Because we're directing a beam, uh, say, at you, and everybody in the way is going to be uh, directly in line of sight of that beam, and that focused energy is going to be getting anything, anyone, any plant, animal, bird, insect, bee, is also going to be intercepted by that. But also, somebody over there, and somebody over there is also going to get a hefty dose of your signal as well. So, I found this uh, as I was preparing for this, and, and, and it's the first time I've seen, I've seen the Telstra publicity, you know, the technical reports that they've done, and what they say is that, you know, we've lit up George, and that's all fine, but it doesn't talk about the fact that George is being lit up as well as these sideband reflections, frequencies, and everything else. It's, um, it's, it's highly chaotic. The other thing that um, we mentioned then is that they're going to be rolling out more and more base stations. So the typical, you know, to cover a suburb, um, they'll have four or five base stations at the moment. In order to put 5G out, they'll need to put in a denser network. And the, the upshot of this is that we don't get so many hotspots very close to the base stations because the base stations aren't as strong. But what we do see are less, you know, dark patches. It's a much more uniform, consistent field across the whole metropolitan area. You won't be able to escape this stuff. It's going to be there, and it's just going to increase the average level for everybody, regardless of where you are. Uh, this I got from an American study looking at um, where they've they put in some 5G towers in a neighborhood, and then they've gone to see well, where do you get signal. And what's interesting, green we get a signal, and red you don't. And again, that's because the 5G signals that they're trying to propagate, they just don't work very well in the real world. Um, so this, this part of the neighborhood, we've got very good signal, a street over, we've got nothing, so they'll be putting in another um, tower somewhere near the missionary of charity, uh, if you want to go there for um, whatever purpose. Um, 
So yeah, we're going to see a lot more build out of, of telecommunications equipment and you're not going to find uh, dead spots for very long. Another thing that the technology brings is that uh, we currently have Wi-Fi, we have Ethernet cables. Ethernet cables are great, they're high speed, they're secure, but if you try to get too far away, the, signal, the, the wire gets in the way. So that's a problem with Ethernet. So then we'll use Wi-Fi, which isn't as fast. Um, it's also, if I move out of here, away from the Wi-Fi signal here going next door, I have to connect onto somebody else's Wi-Fi network and put in the username and password, and then that has to connect and it doesn't work very well. Um, 4G doesn't have that problem because you can just go from cell to cell to cell, the phone just connects on, and you don't even know that you've moved from one uh, base station to another. It hands off very smoothly, um, but it's expensive. Uh, if you try and run, uh, you know, kids who like to stream YouTube on, on a 4G plan, you're going to be up for a hefty bill at the end of the month. We've also got Bluetooth, so you can have your Bluetooth headphones, your Bluetooth devices, everything's connected including more and more uh, embedded devices, things like you know, internet and fridges, temperature sensors, cars, everything else. 5G effectively brings all the benefits of these technologies together into one shot. Meaning that you won't have to have a broadband router in your home because you'll just be on 5G. You won't have to have a separate mobile plan from a, base, from a, from a broadband plan because it'll all just be 5G. You won't need to worry about running a network cable to your uh, home computer because it'll just be on 5G. Sounds terrific, right? Um, but it would be terrific if it was benign, um, but it's not benign. So let's get into it. Safety. 5G is safe. I pulled up uh, this uh, series of, uh, of articles that have come out in the last month or so. Uh, 5G hysteria is coming because we're all just being hysterical. Uh, Telstra has done surveys that showed that it's well below safety levels. Um, New York Times, it's the health hazard that isn't. And it's just a big health scare. So with that, thank you very much. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Not so soon. <laughs> No, no, I've got, a, I've got a whole second half to go. We're talking safety now. Oh, okay. No, no, no. Um, this, uh, this article appeared in a Swiss um, online magazine recently um, where uh, residents in Geneva are experiencing headaches and all kinds of health symptoms, nosebleeds and the like because the 5G has been switched on. That's the first one where I've seen real world um, first person experience being reported in, uh, in the media. Um, Devra Davis uh, over the weekend put out a phenomenal rebuttal of the New York Times, well worth looking at, she's, she's terrific. Um, and I've been trying to, I've been starting to read the thesis of uh, Don Mesh, uh, who did uh, his thesis at the University of Wollongong about um, wireless safety in Australia. He also wrote a chapter for a book, which I've got my copy here. Um, and I forget the name of the book, but that's okay. He's uh, very well uh, versed in the subject of wireless safety regulation in Australia and why it's totally perverted. Oh, there it is, Corporate Ties That Bind. That's it, that's a 2016 book. Uh, Don's page in that is superb. It also talks about things like the nuclear industry, uh, the corruption in that in the UK. Uh, so it's a real global um, piece, really eye -opening. In Australia, uh, radiation, because this is what we're talking about, this is non-ionising radiation. Okay. Ionising radiation is X-rays, gamma rays and sun ultraviolet, where it can knock electrons off an atom. Um, radio frequencies are non-ionising, but all radiation in Australia is governed by our Panzer. For non-ionising radiation, our Panzer bases its standard on work done by ICNER, the International Committee on International Commission on Non-Ionising Radiation Protection. Well, doesn't that sound official? <laughs> Just so we're clear, you would expect that somebody with a title like that would be commissioned. 
they're not commissioned. You'd expect that they're under the auspices of the United Nations or someone like that. They're not. You'd expect that they'd have an open uh, election process where people are nominated. They don't. IGNA is registered as a social club in Munich. Okay? So it's a, it's a private old boys drinking club. But nonetheless, they're used to set the standards that are used for radiation protection uh, in a number of countries around the world. The dark blue countries all follow ICNA. So we've got the UK, France, Germany, Spain, Norway, uh, lots of South America, and of course Australia, Indonesia, a lot of South Asia, Japan's in there. Interesting to note, there's a little country here called Russia. They don't follow it. No, there's, a, there's another one here called uh, China. Uh, they don't. Um, and there's one here which actually, that's interesting. Israel is, is highlighted in dark blue. I'm surprised at that. I thought they had different standards, but that's okay. The US is under FCC, but guess what? It uses the same uh, principles as, as it no, anyway, so it's not about that. But Russia and China and some of these blue areas, these light blue areas, they have dramatically lower standards. So these are the permissible power levels that we can get. So Australia, UK, US is on the right here, maxing things out at, um, I think it's 10,000 watts, uh, 10 watts per centimeter squared or something like that. Um, we have down here though, China, it's way down there. Ukraine is way down here, um, and then we have certain cities, including Brussels. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I think there's some some big organisation based in Brussels. Is it the European Commission? That, that would be it. So, so they have they have the lowest standard that I'm aware of, whereas the rest of us are up here. So, what does safety mean? What does a safety limit mean? These are the maximum permissible safety levels. Okay, so a safety level is just an arbitrary point. Okay, it's a, it's a level that if you exceed, then the regulator will come and talk to you. But it's just been picked, and it's been picked based on, on, on research. Now this is interesting, I found this uh, researching for, um, uh, for this event. What would happen in Sydney if you applied the Brussels uh, level of, of radiation protection, you would not get telephone signal in most parts of Sydney. Here we have Sydney nicely covered, uh, but if you apply the Brussels uh, standard, then you wouldn't be able to put out um, mobile mobile phones like we currently have. And it is a it's been recognised as a major problem for Brussels, where they aren't rolling out 5G because they can't guarantee that they'll be able to do it and maintain within the radiation limits that are there. Australia, it's fine because we have a different decision about what safety is. Uh, ICNA put out their guidelines and then the Australian government through our PANZA um, codified that into a, uh, a national standard. Uh, any guesses when the standard was published? given that mobile phones have developed heavily in the last 10 years or so. That's right, this was published in 2002. So it's bang up to date. Although, <laughs> although well, it did have uh, a minor update in 2016, but they didn't fix the spelling mistake that was on the second page. What mistake? A spelling mistake. Spelling. Yes. Let's not get into factual mistakes. They can't even get the spelling right. Um, this is a diagram of a uh, mobile phone base station on the top of a tower. If you have, this is the, um, what is this? If we're in Australia, we can stand just outside the yellow and we'll be safe. If you're in Brussels, you have to be over here before you're safe. So that's the real impact that the Australian safety regulation system has, is that we're able to get such higher density of wireless devices in the Australian environment than, uh, than other places overseas. In places, sorry to interrupt, but it's relevant to this. Brussels, did they develop their safety limits on research or just because they too just 
That is the $64,000 question. So, reading the PhD of Don Mesh, uh, and I haven't got all the way through it yet, but what he concludes is that there's two ways of applying a regulatory framework to define safety. One is a precautionary, and one is a permissive basis. And in the US, for instance, where they have uh, what's the Environmental Protection EPA? The Environmental Protection Agency got really wound around the wheels in the way that it was trying to define and manage um, safety limits. It was going into the weeds with, in, in relation to research and, and everything else and they couldn't make decisions. So they decided to simplify it, throw out all the radiation that was too, uh, all the research that was too hard, and just go, whatever the industry says, because industry is the expert, that's what we'll go with. And if somebody comes along and is able to disprove that, then we'll, we'll fix it afterwards. Okay, they went for the, put it in place, and then we'll fix it later. That's what ICNERP does, that's what Australia has. And the situation now is, I don't know how we are expected to now prove uh, issues with the safety standard given the thousands and thousands of research papers that have demonstrated biological effects lower than the safety limits. That is a broad body of science now as well established that um, biological effects, health effects, occur below the safety limit, but our Panza, IGNA, refused to consider that. Uh, so I don't know. I, I'm, it baffles my mind. It's all thermal. It is yeah, all thermal. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> and in fact, ICNOP is confused, if you want my opinion, because it says here, uh, no evidence that radio frequency, electromagnetic frequencies cause such disease as cancer. Uh, the available results of the NTP study do not change this view. So, last year, the US National Toxicology Program concluded a multi-year uh, $25 million research program looking at uh, mobile phone effects at increasing cancer in rats. Okay? They weren't testing humans. They weren't testing the limits at which cancer occurs. What they were trying to establish was, can radio frequency emissions cause cancer? And they concluded, well, yes, they do. And when you look at the uh, National Toxicology Program, it says, clear evidence of tumours in the hearts of male rats, some evidence of tumours in the brains of male rats, some evidence of tumours in the adrenal glands of male rats. They found mobile phone radiation causes cancer. They didn't state it causes cancer in humans because they weren't testing humans. They didn't say the level that it causes cancer. They said it causes cancer and that we need more research because this is a concern. But our friends at IGNOP said, well, there's no evidence of cancer. So that's what we're up against, folks. Um, the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, who are somewhere inside the United Nations, the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. Okay, so these guys are lobbying for, they're pro-telecom, they're not pro-health but they found uh, that it was noted the adoption of lower EMF exposure limits is likely to stifle innovation and development of networks. How terrible. So we can't have safety limits because it might affect the rollout of, of, of mobile, uh, mobile networks. And George, you just mentioned thermal limits, and this is, this is what IGNO bases its standards on, that's what our pans are bases its standards on. Does the device cause heating in a short amount of time. Can we measure an increase in heat over a six minute period? That's what the standard's based on. Well, with 5G, we've already found problems with the thermal limit. This was a, a, a paper I came across in the bio EM 2018, so just last year. Latest research indicates that the currently proposed limits may not prevent thermal tissue damage. All right. So who is IGNOP? 
Well, this is a gentleman by the name of Rodney Croft. He's at the University of Wollongong. And because he's, um, he's leading the effort into the uh, uh, biophysical impact of uh, radio frequency radiation, clearly he has the, uh, uh, he's, he's well credentialed to be looking at these things because he's a, oh hang on, he's a psychologist. <laughs> Do you think this is a head game? It's a head game. Uh, you look at it you know, on Wikipedia and uh, we've got some criticism here which I'll just read out. It's most curious, to say the least, that the applicable official threshold values for limiting the health impact of extremely low frequency of blah 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 and high frequency blah 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 were drawn up by ICNERP, a non-government organisation whose origin and structure are none too clear and which is furthermore suspected of having rather close links with industries whose expansion is shaping rank recommendations for maximum threshold values for different frequencies. Doesn't look good. On the other side, we have uh, the International Agency for Research of Cancer, who are under the World Health Organization and are actually a legitimate organization. Um, and they, in 2011, announced that they had classified electromagnetic radiation as possibly carcinogenic to humans. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, lasers are used for, um, you know, laser cutting. Um, you can cut through metal, and also for yeah, tattoo removal and, and healing properties as well. And lasers are very interesting from that point of view. And you know, and, and microwave radiation is one of the only proven, demonstrated, effective um, uh, uh, treatments for Alzheimer's disease. They put emitters on the head, and they can actually break up the um, the proteins in the brain. And they uh, say that all the chemicals that people take now to, for their health, that lasers are actually far more safe than taking all the really pharmaceuticals. That, um, so that, that's why lasers are coming into vogue, and that's why you have difficulty. But, but you also don't need to be a medically trained or a... Like, you can go and buy a medical laser mm -hmm. and set yourself as a tattoo removalist, and you don't need any qualifications for that. But I, I presume that the device itself would have to have, have you know, satisfied. There are standards. Yeah. But on a separate kind of metaphor, I do Chinese medicine. You've got the Chinese medicine people and the naturopaths. The TGA is taking it out on the naturopaths. Do you know why? Because and not Chinese medicine. Because 30 years ago, me and a girlfriend made the first submission to Parliament House for registration of Chinese medicine as a profession. So what I'm saying to you, you've got these other organisations. Who cares? Get yourself all the evidence together and submit it directly to Parliament House and get them to confront the evidence. Yeah, and we're trying to. Um, every time that we approach uh, anybody with political power, um, they just flick us and say our hands are managed. Is it? Um, I watched uh, Ray Bloom, uh, Ray Broomhall. Ray Broomhall is a, is a lawyer. He's, he's actually had a lot of success in the last few years of opposing construction of mobile towers throughout Australia. Um, he was at an event in 2016 in Croydon and that's where I first met him. But I was watching, because um, he was going, he had a couple of hour video about how to tackle this from a uh, disputing construction. Uh, but he said, go and read the, uh, the, the Arpanza was established through the Arpans Act. And if you go and read that, and the first thing it says is that it's established to protect the health of Australians. And I believe that they are being negligent in that. And that's why I want two things. I want two things. I want a moratorium on 5G, and I want a Royal Commission on Arpanza. Yeah. That's what I want. I want those two things. Right? I'm, I'm clear what I want. Because it, causes, it potentially causes cancer in humans. We've seen it causes cancer in rats. I'm not a guinea pig. My kids aren't guinea pigs. 
by initiative report in 2012 gave all of the uh, impact, and I think, Angela, you'll be talking about EHS symptoms uh, later. Uh, but it says here, the standard of evidence for judging the science, the standard of evidence for judging the science, ev scientific evidence should be based on good public health principles rather than demanding scientific certainty before actions are taken. And it speaks to your point earlier. You know, why aren't these uh, quantified effects being considered within the standards? Possibly it's because if, um, if somebody gets burned, you can switch on the, the emission source, you can burn them, you can switch it off, and you stop burning them. It, it's unequivocal. Turning on a device, having cancer in 30 years, that's tough. They managed it with tobacco, but guess what the difference between tobacco and, and telco is? The difference is, back in the day, the regulators were against tobacco. With telecommunications, the regulators are on the side of the telcos, not on the side of us. It's a huge difference, it's going to be a much bigger struggle. And it took 30 years of clear evidence of tobacco causing cancer before anything was done to rain load bugs in. And the money's huge. Okay, you think tobacco's big. The money in telco is big. The money in military is even bigger. And that's where this technology is coming from. That's where this te technology is driving. So the vested interests are much more entrenched in much deeper pockets. You can look at that. These are all the bio effects that um, the Bio Initiative report reported on. And this is really, and I'll conclude here, in justice you are innocent until proven guilty. Okay? But what we have with electromagnetic is that it's safe until proven harmful. That's the wrong way around. It should be flipped on its head. We should assume it's harmful until it's proven safe. But we don't have that. So we have thermal effects. We have nothing at all. We have all of these non-biological effects, non-thermal biological effects like uh, cancer, DNA damage, and neurological effects. And those are just going in the too hard basket of inconvenience and we'll ignore them. I'll wrap up there. Um, if you want to look at the slides, they're there. The QR code takes you there. I've got a YouTube channel that I'm starting up as the EMF inspector. And um, I'm just going to keep shouting as hard as I can, as loud as I can. Oh, sorry, can I just say one more thing? Yeah. Um, somebody from the uh, Stop Smart Meters Australia group uh, dropped these off uh, just this evening as well. These are postcards that you can send to the Honourable Suzanne Lay, MP Minister for the Environment. Please grab one, fill it in. You need to put your name, address and a stamp on the back and send it in. We need to make some noise. We need to let these people know that we are concerned, we're not happy and we need our voices to be heard. Because we're looking after Australia, okay? We're here to do that. Thank you so much, Victor. <laughs> All right, we're going to keep uh, to continue with these presenters. Um, I just want to introduce Bella, who is also uh, back in uh, what was it, December, she instigated to organize the first 5G event for the local community. Unfortunately, well, that event um, was a little bit ahead, so Bella went through the rabbit hole and then uh, organized this event where only about 10 people came. And uh, we sort of let it, let it go for a few months until Angie and Itama, who also organized this event with us, uh, sort of keep a little more strength and momentum, so let's just continue and do it again. And, and then that's something that um, I guess Bella's going to talk and then let's see what she has to say. Thank you, Tomasito. <laughs> so, yeah, my name is Bella and I'm a bowen therapist, a detox coach, and I'm uh, going to have a baby soon. And <laughs> so I'm a concerned citizen that cares about my health the health of the next generation, and most importantly, our ecosystem, because without our ecosystem, we wouldn't be here. And Tomas is a technical freak. <laughs> <laughs> so together, we need technology for our businesses, for advertising, for researching, 
and socialising, and a lot of people here in the world rely on technology. So we have to come with a different approach and not say, stop using your mobile phones because they're harmful. Uh, so we care very deeply about our health. So through our research on EMFs over the last few years, we have figured out ways to use technology in a healthy way without being exposed to too much radiation. And we would like to share our tips with you. So I'd just like to say that I'm not a, I'm not a scientist, technician or doctor, so everything I mentioned tonight, I ask that you do your own research and make up your own mind. Now I'm going to go a little bit fast because we're running over time, so any questions tonight, we'll just leave them till the end. Now, I would advise you to jot this down. Uh, when talking about uh, EMF radiation, there'll be a lot of people that'll say, well, there's no scientific proof. Well, if you go to ehtrust.org, click on science and click on research on wireless health effects, you will come up with thousands of peer-reviewed scientific studies of the biological effects of wireless radiation. Has <coughs> everyone got that? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> so shove that in your faces. <laughs> subject as well, you might butt heads with certain people that will say wireless radiation is safe because it's non-ionizing and non-thermal, as uh, Richard said, uh, which means it doesn't heat up the cells like ionizing radiation from microwaves and x-rays. Now, just because it's non-thermal doesn't mean it doesn't have an effect on us on a cellular level. The only tests that telecoms do are thermal tests. And they state that mobile phones don't heat up our cells, so they are considered safe. However, they have never studied the biological effects. Now, under the safety and legal conditions of mobile phones, it states that phones should be kept at least 15 centimetres from the body and not to be carried on the body. Now, who does that? I know I do, but not many people. And on my Samsung um, mobile, it states that Samsung software is not intended for use by persons under the age of 13. Uh, so how many parents know that? And I see a lot of two-year-olds using devices and streaming videos and playing computer games and, and at the same time they're saying they shouldn't be. So these legal statements are to cover their asses because telecoms know that these devices can cause damage, especially to children. As we can see from this picture, that the younger the child, the more effects they get from wireless radiation. As you can see that it absorbs into their brains much more than adults. Now it takes 25 years for a child's brain to fully develop. Now us older generations, our brains developed without this type of radiation around us. It's only in the last 15 years that almost everyone has smartphones that, where they keep the internet on and they have uh, modems and other devices in their home that are wireless so they're constantly radiating what, uh, radiation. Now we were not exposed to these wireless radiations in our home and on our bodies when we were growing up. I had a brick phone at the age of 16, my first phone, and I just used it for emergency calls and it didn't have the internet. But nowadays everyone has smartphones with internet with uh, the internet on and they don't realise that uh, even when they're not using it, the phone is communicating with Wi-Fi towers and modems and Bluetooth devices. So I would stress that it's really important to turn those things off when you're not using them. Now these are just some of the common effects that scientists have noticed from exposure to wireless radiation. I'm not going to go through them all, but there they are, and there's more. A Brazilian study concluded that over 80% of people that succumb to certain types of cancer lived close to phone towers. These cancers were primarily found in prostate, breast and kidneys and liver. 
So with 5G, they're proposing towers every 50 metres. So that will not be good for our health. So we are electrical beings. That's not hippy dippy shit. It has been proven scientifically that all cells in our body and in nature communicate through electrical, rhythmic, natural pulses. The um, irregular man-made pulses that come from radio frequencies are disrupting our cells' ability to communicate. Now, Dr. Tennant is recognized as one of the top 25 doctors in the US. He has healed himself and thousands of others from chronic illnesses by bringing their body voltage back to its natural state. Dr. Tennant realized that wireless radiation and an unhealthy diet disrupts our body's natural voltage and makes our cells acidic. Our cells can only heal and regenerate in an alkaline. The body cannot function in an acidic environment. So calcium leaches from our bones to neutralize these acids, causing degenerative diseases. He also realized that all his clients were deficient in iodine. Iodine depletes when exposed to radiation. Radiation is very important for thyroid function. Our thyroid glands use iodine to make thyroid hormones, which help control growth, repair damaged cells, and support a healthy metabolism. So, to stay healthy in this wireless environment, it's very important to eat highly alkalized foods from vegetables, greens, and fruits. Eat foods high in iodine that are also highly alkaline, like seaweeds and kelp is one of the highest forms. Uh, detox periodically. Do a heavy metal detox at least once in your life. Now, with heavy metals, they absorb and reflect radiation. So if the more heavy metals we have in our bodies, the more uh, these wireless radio radiation devices affect us. So it's very important to do a heavy metal detox, but that needs to be done under supervision. And it's advised to do a colon, liver, kidney detox before heavy metals so that your channels are clear. Drink lots of good quality water and ground yourselves outside outside to discharge electrical energy, especially before bed. Now, with this multimeter meter, I can't show you here because one of the rods needs to be grounded and the other rod you hold and you can see um, your own voltage. So it proves that we do have a voltage, we are electrical beings. And when you hold it and touch the laptop, especially the laptop is very high in um, frequencies, your voltage will go up astronomically. And then you can test yourself outside when you ground yourself, take your shoes off, and the body can discharge that electrical energy. So it's very important to do that before bed so, you, so that you can get a sound sleep. So just on a few um, eco effects. So it has been proven that phone tower signals disrupt all flying insects and birds' ability to navigate. Insects and birds use the Earth's magnetic field to navigate back to their nests, beehives, and to migrate to cooler or warmer climates. In the last 10 years since 4G has come along, the bee population and small bird populations has decreased 40%. Now, when I was a kid, I lived in an industrial area near the city, and I remember looking up at the sky and seeing these amazing bird formations, uh, like the triangle of bird formations, and now I live near the mountain, and I look up and I don't see that, haven't seen that for years. So. Do you have a link to where that information comes from? Yeah, there's, there's, a, yeah, there's a lot of... If you write your email down, it's going to be shared. I'm going to share. And It'll be shared. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, shielding ourselves from wireless radiation. Now, there are a lot of products out there, but there's really no proof that uh, stickers, plugs, and pendants work. Um, actually, they could be more dangerous. I have a sticker on the back of my phone, but there's <laughs> so much radiation comes from the phone. But there's no way this little sticker is going to do anything. And 
yeah, it can be more dangerous because people will be like, well, I've got a sticker on the back of my phone, and so it should be safe, right? No. <laughs> Say that again. How does 5G tie into those smart meters? Ah, uh, they don't. They're, yeah, it's nothing to do with the smart meters. They're just all smart radiation. Yeah. As far as I know, it creates a But do they, what sort of frequency are they? Which, which one? 5G? Smart meters. Smart, smart meters. You'll have to ask Richard about that kind of stuff. At the end, we'll talk more about that, yeah. Because you're talking about like protecting and you can actually get cages and all yeah, that. Right. Yeah. So why can't we do something like that for our phones? For the phone? Yeah. You won't, then you probably won't get a signal. Yeah. You probably won't you get a get signal. Stickers. You can get stickers to put on your phones as well. Yeah, and, and I've tried them all yeah. and we've got a meter and it just, you just, it doesn't work really. Yeah. I don't know, maybe it works on another level but... So it's actually better to turn the internet off your phone when you're not using it rather than just expect that the sticker's going to work. And it's also good that when you're on a call or using the internet to not actually try not to touch your phone, like lean it against something, put it on the loudspeaker, speak like that, get on um, some earphones, but make sure that they're wired, not wireless, because when they're wireless, you're going to get that radiation right into your inner ear. So that's very important. Uh, shielding paint, mesh and fabrics work. Um, it's, you can use them on your smart meter. Um, it is good to, or you can use uh, like the curtains on windows if you have like a phone tower coming in, uh, the, the radiation from the phone tower, but it is good to um, get a building biologist to come and measure all those things. Do you want to leave it till the end? Yeah, yeah, we're like, I'm trying to like rush it here. <laughs> um, yeah, and Tomas is going to talk about so uh, wiring all our devices. It, it is inconvenient, but it's convenient for our health. Uh, and you can use the internet uh, with the Wi-Fi off just by wiring things. So I'm going to leave it to Tomas now. Thank you. Awesome. So, um, yeah, so uh, wiring devices and Wi Fi. So, um, yeah, as, as, as we just say, it's going to be very difficult to escape from any 5G uh, exposure, especially if you're going to be in the city. Um, we're here in the hills. Uh, I think that um, we still can do a lot of things on a day basis to protect ourselves. One of the things that we did is to actually go um, and wire our house with Ethernet cords. So basically, uh, how many places do you use at home to do your work or use your laptop or your computer or even same time with your phone because I understand that more now more than ever, People, youngsters, they they barely using the notebook. They're using their phones. Uh, so there are also ways to use them in a more safe way, right? So that's why we decided to while our home put uh, Ethernet cables all around from our garage where actually our modem is, right? So uh, we we have uh, our modem in the garage, and from there we cable to all the house. It was very inconvenient because we had to uh, purchase over 100 meters of, of, so of, uh, of the Ethernet cables and there's so many different levels of quality for these guys. So uh, this is a Cat7 gold-plated Ethernet cable and um, probably the most expensive on the market. So there's different grades of uh, Ethernet LAN cables. Uh, and, and to be honest, I have no idea until I start researching, trying to find ways to expose myself less to this. Does uh, it make a difference on the length of the internet as to the quality? Yeah, so this is, this is amazing because in terms of the speed, if, if, if they come to say to you that Wi-Fi and 5G is going to be faster, well, that's a lie. Wire is always going to be faster yeah. because Ethernet, and I'm going to show later, it works through light, pulses of light. 
to transmit that information through, a, uh, through the core. So it has advantages that it is, it is faster and more efficient to transmit data than a wireless system. It doesn't require to be looking for a signal, it's always connected. Um, so, so yeah, so basically uh, when I, uh, in here about uh, a couple of weeks ago, we got the NBN. Uh, the NBN has, is, going, is going active in the zones, which is fiber optics. They forced me, Optus forced me to get a new modem. Uh, this modem, um, it was 5G enabled, so it was ready to start sending me 5G signals. I wasn't given an option, it was sort of a mandatory thing, trying to organize with them uh, how to disable the 5G. I couldn't because the modem was inbuilt, so whatever I put the modem in my office or something like that, it was emitting naturally 5G waves whether I had a device that received that signal or not. So I thought it was criminal by not giving me the information or a chance to choose. So I said, tell them to screw off. I changed providers to another MBN and I said, I'm gonna get my own modem. So I just went to JCAR, pay 40 bucks on this little thing, uh, which I can, can configure, configure and disable the Wi-Fi altogether, uh, mainly because I only use the, as I say, the ethernet ports. Um, Uh, most of them they do. Uh, this one was Exidol, which is another one of the NBN companies. Um, they're probably one of the cheapest NBNs around. And, um, at least they gave me the choice, you know? I think Optus and Deltra don't give you the choice. They want to force you to use their modems. And they make it difficult to use and say, I don't want 5G, can you stop it? So, uh, but then if you are going to have a modem at home, you, may, you can make sure when you purchase it that it doesn't send and it's not able to send 5G devices, so this is like 4G locked. Even if I have a 5G device and I connect to it, it won't go through that high because it, it can't go uh, that much. So the other thing that I found interesting and I discovered recently is that my phone can be connected to internet. Um, and this is a $20 device that, um, just this is a demonstration, so, a little bit uncomfortable, I understand that, but if you're gonna work at home with your phone for a long time, uh, and especially like, this is so classic, people holding their phones, so as Bella said, try not to hold it from place in somewhere else, but even with this, it was completely wired under a mirror to try to test the radio frequency, there's nothing coming out of it. So it is safe, it is contained, on the cable itself, it doesn't leach radiation. That's why it's so important to still consider wiring as an option to protect yourself in the meantime. Where did you get that from? Oh, just J car. J car. What is it called? J car. Oh, it's the, like, the device. Uh, this. The, the adapter. Uh, this adapter? Yeah. Yeah, it's aligned to a USB, basically. And it has a little, little thing that converts it to your phone. So this is just a 20 buck thing, it's just, it has an ethernet port to a USB and then you can buy and a little adapters that goes to your iPhone or your Android, whatever. Um, so yeah, so one of the things like, uh, I can understand that, um, you know, wireless is convenient, like you say, it's everywhere, but we have to be smart about it. Uh, we cannot just be here all the time. Uh, we see these uh, people uh, trending with the, with the wireless, uh, uh, iPhone, um, he, you know, headphones, listen to music, people that go to the gym, I go to the gym quite a lot, and I see all the people either on their phones or with the, you know, the Bluetooth headphones, and then they think they're doing, like, they're healthier, but the truth is that they're having a microwave right in the ear constantly. So that is just the dumbest thing. And then Itama here uh, actually has this, uh, this EMF friendly, um, headphones, which which finish here, there's an air chamber that diffuses all the <laughs> radiation when it's wired and then you're listening to your music, I guess. So there, there are friendly choices to make so in order to help you. Not all wired earphones are okay, is that what you're saying? I think most, uh, in my understanding, Sorry. most of the, that the wiring uh, uh, headphones are to some degree uh, not the best. Uh, and there's some damage, there's some frequencies going. So it's the magnetic fields, yeah, yeah because they've got uh, 
uh, very very dense tidal magnets and, and little motors driving the, the radiation. It's right, it's, the sound is right in your ear. So those are three three bucks on eBay. Okay. So you know what you're getting yeah, uh, and they don't quite sound as good, but they sound pretty good. Um, but my ears feel so much better. Yeah, I mean, we're going to share the links to some of the EMF uh, stores in Australia where you can access to all these gadgets and protection devices or things. Um, I'm going to continue, I'm going to leave the questions for the end just to respect the people. So so basically, yes, we have uh, also the Bluetooth speakers that they refuse to turn themselves off. This, we used to have this exact model, Bose, it went flat battery, uh, it wasn't connected to any sort of uh, music and it was sitting under our bed and with our meter we were getting high readings of uh, you know, of frequencies, and we, like, we didn't know where it came from. Finally, we realized that it was coming from this. It was like a little antenna under our bed that we thought, because it doesn't have any battery left, it should be flat, but it's not. And it cannot be turned on. We have to sell it. We have to keep it outside our home because it's just con continuously emitting. So when we see things like even um, this sort of wireless, even the pointer that I'm using right now is connected to this USB in my computer, so I'm literally getting what, uh, radiation in my hand as we speak. And I'm just doing over the convenience, but when I'm home, I try to make me, my, my space as safe as possible. And there's a few things, like when you're working with your laptop, uh, you can have a wire mouse. I know that Bella at home uses a wire keyboard, so she doesn't have to touch the keyboard of his, her own notebook. So that's, that's pretty radical, isn't it? Some people don't know that if you're working on your laptop and your laptop is charging at the same time, you're also getting electromagnetism in your hands and raise your voltage. So every time I work with my notebook, my charger is off. It's not even touching. So I try to, and it's wired because it's also connected to the Ethernet cable. So when I come with my meter and I start analyzing my working space, there's nothing. There's no radiation whatsoever and it makes a huge difference in my performance when I'm working and, and also to, to know that I, I, I'm not exposing myself to anything. So Ethernet cables are a must, right? I understand that Wi-Fi is here to stay and I, there's many, many other things that uh, will continue to make the Wi-Fi safer, but in the meantime, in the meantime, the best way is to stay wired. Stay away. When you go out and you need to use the internet, I understand, but if you're at home, then you have no excuses. And as I said, what is fiber optics? What is this, uh, this MBM, this cable internet we have, this Ethernet? It's just, it's just pulses of light transmitting data. A lot of people think that when we, we connect, for example, overseas, like from Australia, if we want to send information to South America, let's say, then we do it satellite, but that's not true. There's massive highways of fiber optics under the ocean to every single country. That's how we connect internet between nations. We don't do it satellite, that's a big lie. More interesting enough, we've got something called quantum optics, right? And quantum optics, it's, it's, it's a whole field that's been well researched for over 25 years now and doing many experiments using light to transmit data using light. And what do you mean, what? Do you, can you transmit data with light? Absolutely, it's called Li-Fi. Li-Fi, it's been, it's been there for a long time. And what's the difference between Li-Fi and Wi-Fi? It's like Li-Fi, you can transmit information with a normal, healthy wave, instead of being 5G, like a laser beam, when it's disruptive and unnatural, with Li-Fi, you can use any light to transmit data safely. Why are they using that? Because monetary... <laughs> because people want to make billion dollars rolling out 5G. That's the simple of that. Uh, they, and then once they realize I've created all these problems, 
then I'm gonna wipe it out and say, oh, we got now, this uh, is safer now, I and mean, it is true. It, this could be rolled out many years ago, and it hasn't, and it's been pushed into the dark because there's not enough evidence to put it in a commercial thing, but there's also no research on 5G either, and it's still rolling it out, so it really doesn't make any sense. I just want you to understand that there's many ways to communicate data wirelessly and way safer and way better for ourselves. Thomas, uh, am I reading that you're thinking that this 5G will roll out? You, you know that it's been touted as a $12.5 trillion industry. Everyone's going to make yeah, millions and billions. Exactly. It, it, from what you're saying, it sounds to me like there's a possibility it could not before it affects people, but it could fall over and be some kind of like a bit of a financial white elephant if this Wi-Fi is... I, I think so. Yeah, I possibly. think that... Uh, possibly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I, I believe the same. I think it's just part of the agenda. Um, anyway, so uh, I'm just going to leave it there. We have plenty of questions at the end. And, um, if you want to know more about healthy habits, just stay around after the event so we can discuss all the options. So I'm just going to leave you with Angie. Ah, so we're gonna go. Sorry, actually, it's gonna be first. Michael. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I forgot. So, I have Karen Bell here. She used to be a Fentry Gallery resident, uh, and recently she moved to rural Victoria. And she used to own a yoga studio, and she discovered, I think, uh, a lot of this information through uh, Sasha Stone, the documentary. So she felt this call to action to spread the word and get to know this uh, to a deaf. So she just came back from Bali for the New York Festival. It was amazing. So she's going to share with us uh, her experience and, and her advice. So just give it a round of applause. Thank you, Thomas. It's a first time I've heard of Wi-Fi. So I continually learn. It's wonderful. So I come from Namurka, which is rural Victoria. It's about three three hours away from here. I came down this morning. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So up until a month ago, I was living in Country Valley for about 18 years. My partner and I had a manufacturing business in Wontona in Lewis Road. We designed and manufacture a meditation bench. And prior to that, I had a yoga studio in Upper Country Gully on the Hood Highway. So a month ago, we moved our business to Namurka for a number of reasons which I won't go into. I've been following Sasha Stone for about four years and I really like the way he speaks. He's very, very erudite. He has created an organisation, International Diplomacy, called Humanitat, and that was decades ago. And in 2015, he started an organisation with, uh, with other people called the ITNJ, which is the International Tribunal of Natural Justice. So I'm quite new to 5G. It's only as recently as March that I was listening to Sasha Stone being interviewed. It must have been on YouTube. And he was talking about an upcoming documentary, a documentary that he's produced, and the documentary is called 5G Apocalypse, an Extinction Event. If you haven't seen it, I recommend that you do. It's on YouTube. I watched it back in March, and for the first time in my life, I observed an inner call to action about 5G. It really, really affected me in a, a positive way, because there were a number of areas in my life that I could have taken an interest in, but I didn't, but 5G has called me. And as a result of watching that documentary, I heard about the New Earth Festival in Bali. And I decided that I was going to go. So I went last month. And it's a seven day event. And three days of the event was a World Health Sovereign Summit. And two days of the event a booklet here. Two days of the event was the International Tribunal of Natural Justice. So the three-day health event, there were a number of speakers. There were about 20 speakers from around the world speaking about a range of topics. 
What was of more interest to me specifically was the ITNJ, the Inter International Tribunal of Natural Justice. The theme for the two days was weaponization of our biosphere. 5G is only one aspect of that. What was not so much disappointing, but what was presented in those two days at the, at the court hearing, there was a public gallery, I was a member of the public gallery, there was a judge, Sir John Branagh, there were other commissioners, and so people presented from around the world on different topics. And the disappointing part of that was many who went to the festival wanted to specifically hear about 5G. I was one of them. So what came out of that, that is that there's going to be, probably next year, a two-day event specifically about 5G. And so I have to go to the next event. <laughs> Um, so coming back to Sasha Stone, watching the... Who has seen that documentary, by the way? So, okay, about a third. It's a pretty hard-hitting documentary. There are other... There are many, many docos and, and short vids and interviews you can see about 5G. So the International Tribunal of Natural Justice is an open court outside the judiciary system that we know it in line with the government. It's totally separate. So it, it gives people who don't have a voice within our current judicial system to be able to give testimony live and as video recorded. So if you want to see testimony in relation to, for example, two years ago, it was about uh, the slave trade and sex trafficking. So that was a three-day event specifically about that topic. This, this year, last month, it was about weaponization of the biosphere. Mm. So I'm just catching my, my train of thought. So the International Tribunal of Natural Justice is an organization that, as I just said, people can give testimony, it's recorded. Um, Sasha Stone, for me, embodies the qualities of what I call the new human. He embodies the qualities of someone who believes in sovereignty, to take our power back, to stand up. And so for me, he is a mentor. He speaks about living men and women of the living soil. He speaks of being able to step outside of the matrix, if you like. It's another way to, to, to speak to where he's coming from. His, his catchphrase is, arise homo sapiens. So he's all about empowering, being able to get together with like-minded people for a cause that you want to take some action about. So I'm very happy to be here tonight because I see a group of people here who are interested, who want to learn, who want to share information, who want to come along and, and after these meetings have face-to-face -face connection and contact. At the moment, most of my connection is on Facebook with the social media with 5G groups. I'm in the very early days of setting up a movement that I'm calling Peas in a Pot, which is Planet Earth Action with People of Diversity. So whether the cause is 5G is your cause, whether it's GMOs, whether it's geoengineering, whatever it is, plastic in the ocean, animal welfare, I see it as a movement that people, regardless of their calling, have a place to feel safe, to share information, to connect. So other than that, that's probably all I want to say, except for one thing. <laughs> one of the speakers was uh, a New Zealand woman. Her name was Ray Rani, and she did speak of, to the 5G. There was a live video stream, Bali at the three-day event, the, the World Health Sovereign Summit. And that was a very good, uh, live stream, she did speak about 5G and she was speaking from the point of view of mitigation. What can you do in your home, in your environment? This is what's been discussed by Thomas and Bella. There's a lot that we can actually do when we know about the damage, when we have a sense of the action that we can take. For example, it's only in the last few months that I'm taking the action of turning off my Wi-Fi at night. I'm using aeroplane mode a lot more. Like I'm really quite new to this. So I'm looking, I'm learning, I'm on a really big learning curve, which I'm sure quite a few of you here are as well. 
Uh, one of the presenters was um, Jim Humble, and he's, he's, he presented, he was interviewed. There was a book launch at the three-day World Health Summit as well, and the book launch was Jim Humble's book. Jim Humble is 86, so he was born in 1933, the same year as my mother. This is his life's work. He's originally an engineer. The solution, this was the book launch. This book is available online as an e-book, free to the world. So that was presented. What is that is the content of the book? Pardon? Is it his life story? What's the book about? It's about, I, very good point. I haven't addressed what, what the book is about. So, again, if you look at mitigation, if you look at the steps you can take to feel stronger in your body, to have a stronger immune system, to ground, to eat appropriate foods. So the solution is about a product, a chemical product that he's come up with. It's called Master Mineral Solution. And I won't go into the name of the two chemicals, but you combine them and it activates. It essentially, in a very basic layman's terms, cleans the blood and moves on disease pathogens. So that's probably all I'm going to say because I'm not technical, I'm not a doctor, I don't have training in that area. So what I wanted to do was mention this from the point of view as a resource. He's, uh, he's been uttered a lot by the pharmaceutical industry because it's an alternative. It's a very cheap alternative where you can take responsibility and self-care, self-education, self-responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I'm going to leave you now with, uh, with Michael Lang. He's a Sassafras resident. Uh, he's been researching 5G for a long time now, and he's going to give a presentation of the legal action that are happening locally. Sorry? Is it okay if I stand here? Oh, you. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, I'm Mike Lane. I'm a Sassafras resident. Um, been living in the hills for about nearly 30 years. Um, love this area. And um, <clears throat> I guess that's what's motivating me in the, the 5G battle is um, a lot of people are saying, oh, we need to move rural, we need to do this or that. Um, I actually like living here. <laughs> I, I want my family to be protected as I live here and I'm living in a healthy environment. So that's what motivates me. I've got six kids. Uh, my oldest is 31, my youngest is 16, and I've got four grandchildren. And so my fight is really about them and um, <clears throat> making sure they've got a clean and healthy environment to live in and uh, that they can grow up and flourish. Um, my focus tonight that I want to speak about quickly, just briefly to you, is I'm focusing on letter writing. So a lot of people want to take action um, and write, know who to write to and, and what to write and this sort of stuff. And you know, I've noticed on the Facebook groups, I'm a member of quite a few of the 5G groups, um, people will put a post up saying, I wrote this letter, here's the letter. And people say, oh, can you send me a template of that? You know, can you send me that? Can I use that letter? And um, I've done the same and, and I've sent templates out, but I've actually stopped doing that because what I'm finding is if you just cop copy and paste the letter and put your name on the bottom, you haven't really engaged with the process. Mm -hmm. So um, I've really looked at going deeper and, and trying to understand what it is that I want to say to people uh, when I write and understand the power of what I say. So I've really broken down the process a little bit. It's good that I've followed on because um, the first part of the process is knowing who you are. All right. So we're going to engage with the system, we're going to engage with the world, we're going to engage with politicians, uh, heads of corporations, people working for corporations, but who am I? And my approach is, to, is that I'm a, I'm a living man of the living soil. Right? I'm a living being. I'm not a corporation. I'm not a person in the sense that a person is a corporate entity. Right? That person on your birth certificate, that whole thing, we're not going into that right now, but um, I'm a man of the living soil, I'm a living man, I'm a living being. Therefore, um, I should have precedence over 
a, a person, a corporation, that's trying to tell me what I can do, how I can live, what they want to put into my environment, what they want to put into my body. And so in that, to understand that is, the, is a powerful start, right? It's knowing who you are. And you can go so deep with that. You know, there's people that have um, created their own um, estates uh, in this country, which is basically their own country. Um, you can go that far if you want to. Um, we're not going to do that tonight, but it's to understand, really have a think about who you are and do some research on that. What is a, what is a living being as opposed to what is a person? So when you're approaching these people, when you're writing letters, to have in mind who it is you are and the power that you possess as an individual. Right. The next step um, is to understand the agenda, understand the 5G system. All right. So do all that research. Um, find out what's planned, what's coming, uh, what's, the mo what's the Sasha Stone movie and other great documentaries that are out there and, and get knowledgeable on it. Um, I tend to wear these t-shirts around and design them myself. If you want one, just give me a boy at the end. Um, I've got another one called 5G Global Kill Shot, which is a great one, a great conversation starter. Um, and what that does is puts me on the spot, so I've actually got to remember some of this stuff that I've been learning and learn how to communicate it with people, all right? And, uh, of course, I want to put that into letters and, and write to people. So the next step in that, this three-step process that I'm thinking about is know who you are, know what the plan or the agenda of 5G is, and then know, understand the nature of the system that you're wanting to communicate with, all right? So it means you're actually you're communicating with a corporate system, all right? You, whether it's the federal government, the state government, the council, the police, um, Telstra or any other telcos that you're talking to, they're all registered corporations. They're all profit-making entities, all right? We haven't had a constitution since 1933. We don't, we don't operate under our constitutional or common law anymore. It just, we just haven't, we haven't had that since 1933. Um, I'm not going into why or how, if you don't understand that, that's fine, but realise that we are in a corporate commercial system and that's, and that's who we're dealing with, people working and operating on that commercial corporate level. There's, a, there's good news about that, in that we can use the principles of their system um, to communicate with them and to get our point across and to achieve things within that realm by using the same principles they do, all right? So when we're writing a letter, um, it's important, if you look at it from the point of view of um, how do we engage, say, with the legal system, all right? Um, and the best way that I've discovered to communicate in, within a legal environment is to remain in innocence, and um, <clears throat> not to bring controversy, to remain in peace. So I'm going to talk to you about writing your first letter. All right, so I'm seeing a lot of letters out there and people have done the scientific research, so they want to put in every link and every piece of scientific evidence and everything else that they've studied into this letter so that the mayor or whoever they're writing to can have all this scientific evidence uh, in your letter and, and that, will, that will change their mind, you know. Um, I've done the research and if they only knew what I know, um, they would make the same conclusions that I've made. Unfortunately, it doesn't work, all right? Um, when you're writing a letter, what I want to encourage you to do is to talk about what you feel and what you believe, all right? What I believe about this system. I've looked at the science and I believe this, all right? Um, the good thing is that some of those statements of belief can actually engage with law, all right? And anything I'm gonna say in this isn't legal advice, I'm not a lawyer, all right? So if you wanna go into a more legal arguments, you need to consult experts on that, not necessarily saying go to a lawyer, but um, that's one option. But um, what, uh, what we need to do is, is think about what we're saying in the letter and what implications that, that has in the commercial realm in that commerce law realm, all right? So that even applies to our courts. Our courts are businesses, they're registered corporations, and they're there to make money, all right? Um, 
So, and 5G is the same. It's about money. The whole thing, it's about money. All right, it's a multi-trillion dollar industry. So we need to be approaching the system from that point of view. How does that affect me? What do I believe about that? I believe that's going to cause me harm. All right, that's a good thing to write in a letter. Why do I say I believe or I'm in fear that it will cause me harm? Because fear of um, being caused harm is, in Victoria, is the legal definition of assault. All right? Uh, if you look up our legal system in Victoria, we don't actually have a definition of assault. The, the word assault doesn't occur in Victorian law. It's called causing harm. All right? So if you write to someone and say, I'm in fear of 5G technology causing me harm, what you're actually saying in the commercial realm is that um, I believe this is assaulting me. And even fear of harm is assault. All right? I shouldn't use the word assault because in Victoria it doesn't exist in the court system, but... Um, is that uh, the Criminal Code? Yes, it is. If you look up the Victorian Criminal Code and, and just Google Victorian law definition, well, I looked in definition of assault and what came up was actually causing harm. And you can see there that a belief or a fear that you're going to be caused harm um, equates to being caused harm. All right, so you can communicate things like that in your letter. All right, ask questions. All right, um, I'll just quickly write, uh, read you out my initial letter to Councillor Noel Cliff. All right, um, this, he's a councillor with Yarra, Yarra Rangers, some of you might be familiar with him. Um, says, Dear Councillor Noel Cliff, I'm a resident of Sassafras and I'm I'm, and I'm keen to find out what Council is doing to oppose 5G rollout in Yarra Ranges. I've read numerous studies which show that the health effects on humans are potentially very harmful and that our Panzer have not carried out any tests for safety of 5G. Um, remind me, there's a, there's a big point on our Panzer I want to just make before I finish, so if I don't say that, Angela, can you just tell me to do that? I note that Optus plant, this is when I was just looking at the Optus transmitter in Mount Evelyn. I note that the Optus, at Optus plans to place a 5G transmitter in Mount Evelyn as part of its 2019 rollout. So I'm fearful of harm from this technology to myself, my family, and other members of the Yarra Rangers community. All right, that's very intentional. Um, saying that as an, I'm intentionally trying to build a legal case. Alpanza has now issued a disclaimer that it can no longer offer medical advice as they are not qualified to do so, to which end I am seeking advice and letters from local med medical practitioners that agree on the potential harm of the 5G network on the human population. All right, here's a link to the Optus rollout announcement. All right, so it was a direct link to what they were proposing to do in Mount Evelyn. I've had some legal advice also, and it appears that success is now being achieved in stopping the rollout by telcos on the basis of the precautionary principle. Um, we'll just define that quickly. Angela, you had a definition of the precautionary principle? Um, yeah, I can just read it out now. Yep. Um, so, precautionary principle is defined as the principle that prevents the that is scientifically plausible but uncertain. Action shall be taken to avoid or diminish harm. Morally unacceptable harm refers to harm to humans or the environment, that is, threatening to human life or health, serious and effectively irreversible, inequitable to present or future generations, imposed without adequate consideration of the human rights of those affected. Yes. Um, I've got the link here. Yeah. Okay, so there's a lot of words there, but basically what it means is that if there's any doubt about a technology or an activity that's going to, that may cause harm to people, then it, it shouldn't be done until it can be ascertained that it won't cause harm. <coughs> yes. So when you send them uh, such a letter also for CEO of Telecommunication Company also? Yes, I've done that with, um, there's the 
uh, 5G tower proposal for Belgrave that's uh, coming up at the moment. Um, that's being handled by Service Stream. Uh, you'll note that they, they tend to put notices in the, in the newspaper, all right? Um, so there was an advertisement that went out, some of us got a copy of it, um, said what address that it's going to be at and um, what they were proposing to do. And there was a contact name and address. It was actually a PO box, so I had, had to look up the street address of the corporation because if I just sent to a PO box, guess what? They can ignore it. All right, so when you're addressing a letter, address it to a person. It's no good saying to the CEO or um, to whom it may concern or whatever. You need to get a name and you need to send to a street address, okay? If you don't do those things, they can ignore you. Do you need to right? register for that? Registering the, the letter is a good idea. I did that when I sent my letter to Service Stream. Sent one to James Merlino as well. They were both uh, registered mail. Yep. Can, can you send something like this, I suppose, on Twitter to that person? No. <laughs> No, yeah. I'll, I'll talk later yeah. about that, no. Yeah, I mean, physically you can. I, I wrote uh, a same copy of a, 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 another letter that I'd sent to Noel Cliff. I put a copy of it on the Yarra Rangers Facebook page to see if I could elicit a public response to it, which I did, which was interesting. And um, so, where was I at? <laughs> um, yeah, so name and address. All right, so on that ad, uh, had her name and a PO box, no good. You got to, so I had to look up Service Stream's headquarters uh, um, and send it to their address uh, as a registered mail um, letter. If you're going to a politician, send it registered mail and go into their office and with a couple of copies and get it stamped that it's been received. All right? Then they can't say they didn't get it. You mentioned different people to send it to. Yes. Yep, so yep. I've sent it to my state MP, my federal MP, I've sent it to the council. Yep. For this notice of my volume which I appreciate yep. coming up. Yep. Do I have to send it to everybody or is that enough? No you don't. Um, uh, the In Power Movement, if, uh, if, in, if you're f not familiar with that, inpowermovement.org, check them out. Inpowermovement is one word, empower, as in I N P O W E R, P -O -W -E -R empowermovement.org. Mm -hmm. They're a Canadian movement, so they've got a similar legal system to ours. It's under the Crown, the same as we are. And um, uh, yeah, they've got a video, a free video you can watch on there on their notice of liability process. Um, and you can look at that. If you sign up, you can watch the second video that actually takes you step by step through their notice of liability. Well, but I'm leading up to that. Yep, just quickly. Hi. Um, yes, when you were saying about putting the letter on in fear of, of fire causing you harm, yes. I was listening to a, um, something from Ray Rumble Hall. Ray Rumble, yeah. Yeah. And he was saying that you can't, you need substantive evidence. He said you have to go to a doctor. Yeah. And that's considered substantive evidence. Yeah. If they say, yes, you have a right to be fearful, yeah. then that will be counted. But if you just say, because yeah. I watched you, they won't yeah. just want that. That's, that's true, um, in the sense that if you, you're going to go to court with your barrister, right, you're going to need that leave. I am going through the process right now, trying to find a doctor who will give me a letter saying that 5G is harmful, oh, EMR, EMFs are harmful. All right, and that's a good thing. I think that's a good process to go through. Talk to your integrated health, GP, local, and see whether they'll give you a letter. Yes? Listening to Ray Broomhall being interviewed, he yep. stated that uh, you didn't have to get the doctor to say that it was going to harm you. No, that's you right. Him to say that he couldn't guarantee that it wouldn't. Yeah, that's right. A bit of a difference. So, yeah, we're not making a claim. So when you're speaking to a doctor, you say, I'm not trying to make a claim that, it's, that it has harmed me, just that the doctor has the opinion that it has the potential to cause harm. All right? That's all your doctor needs to say. And then offer some suggestions about... Uh, what you could do to mitigate damage uh, My own to your body. Would only write 
yeah. my patient believes that EMF is harmful. That's right, yes. And generally what we're finding is that I've approached about half a dozen doctors now and they say, oh yes, I believe 5G is harmful, I believe EMR is, harm uh, is harmful, but I'm not going to give you a letter to that effect because I'm not an expert. All right? So... Yeah, I've done that and the same, I'm getting the same result. And I get um, that, so, scared that they're yeah, end up in, they are. In a That's right. action yeah. yeah. So whilst, let's just keep the questions till the end and I'll, I'll get this finished. I'm, I'd love to answer all your questions, we just don't have time. Um, so uh, in talking to your doctor, let's, let's, let's keep doing that and, and let's share information about who's, who's is prepared to write letters. All right, that's where we can connect on Facebook and other groups and communicate with one another. Um, so if you find someone, communicate it out. Um, maybe don't do that before you've got the letter, you might scare them off. <laughs> but um, uh, at least if you can get a couple of people who can gather that evidence, that'd be fantastic. But what I want to do is just encourage you just to write, your, write a preliminary letter, just jump in there, whether it's your local councillor, whether it's in response to a, a, a proposed tower that's going in in your community, um, start writing letters. The one, if you're in the Yarra Ranges area, the one in Belgrave um, South is coming up to, to council very soon. Um, it hasn't got its town planning approval or anything, so we're really in the box seat to take some action here. Um, the positive thing that's happened on the Gold Coast last week was um, I think it was Ray Broomhall who spoke with a bunch of residents at the Gold Coast Council meeting where they were considering a, considering a proposal and they, they knocked it on the head on the basis um, that Ray Broomhall got up and spoke and said, actually, if you roll this out, you as uh, individuals, you councillors as individuals, could be liable for assault. All right, and at that they were, they were going full steam ahead uh, when he said that. Um, everyone got worried. Oh, we can't hide behind a corporation anymore. This is person <laughs> to person. This is flesh and blood, blood man and woman to flesh and blood man and woman. All right. Um, so uh, the focus of our letters is to remain in that space, in that space of people of the living soil talking to one another. All right. And so when I write a letter to, to, serve, to Barbara Grinter at Service Dream, I'm not writing a Service Dream, I'm by writing to Barbara Grinter personally. When I write to Paul Noldcliffe, I'm not writing the Arrow Rangers Council, I'm writing to Noldcliffe personally. Do you include the corporation in the address when you write it? You yes, write? yes I do. So um, it's not so important on your initial letter though, Richard. Just, um, there's ways to address letters as we get more into maybe a notice of liability situation or trying to lead into that kind of process. Um, but your initial letter should be just something that will get a response. So All right, this is what I'm saying. Sorry, Mark, you wouldn't yeah. be saying things like, I'm going to hold you personally responsible. No, no. Not at that stage yet. No. You want to remain in peace, remain in innocence, ask questions. What it, what are you doing to support us to stop the rollout of 5G? I'm worried about this. I'm concerned about this. Um, you don't need to put any links at all, okay? Um, I'm sorry if that offends anyone who's done that, um, but they're just not going to look at them. You know, I saw one letter that had like 30 links, and they said, check out this link. I'm like, it's just it's not going to happen. What you're trying to do is get a response back. The response will come back saying, we, we comply with our PANSA standards or ACMA standards, all right? All right, that's what we want to hear from them, all right? They say, um, it's safe because our PANSA says so. Problem is, you look at the our PANSA website or the ACMA website and you look at their disclaimer, basically their disclaimer says, every bit of information on this site um, is not expert information, it's for educational purposes only, and basically you can't rely on a scrap of information that's on their site. And get your own medical advice from the doctor. Yeah. It said get your own expert advice, we're not doctors, 
So basically what they're saying is their standards don't actually mean anything. <clears throat> their standards don't have any kind of um, standing or responsibility behind them. There's no one actually taking responsibility for the standards, which means there actually aren't any. From a legal standpoint, as far as I understand it, those disclaimers mean that the data that they put out is meaningless. All right, so you've got these people who are administering um, uh, radiation in our environment who don't take responsibility for anything that they do or say. <clears throat> so, but that works to our advantage because we can move, then move into a process where we can take um, the driver's seat. George, George helped us with um, the James, James Molino letter that uh, Richard wrote. And basically, James Molino came back with the same thing. Our hands are standards, are, we're, we're sticking with that. Um, what George really identified was that he looked at the disclaimer on the website and he said, hang on, this means that James Molino is taking personal responsibility uh, for those standards. Um, then he's putting himself in a position where he's liable for the, for the, value, for the quality and value of that information. Yes, Richard. So I've had further correspondence from James Molino. Yep. And I think this directly is a consequence of you guys following up and putting him in a corner. He's now given me the name of the individual in the department who has the responsibility for setting uh, children's exposure standards. Yep. I emailed her last week. I got an out of office until this week. Yep. I'm hoping for a reply because I only asked a very broad, just introductory a yep. person that sets the standards. Mm -hmm just to get a, an interaction and to understand that yes, this is the person. Yep. She is, uh, she's an epidemiologist, she's a PhD, yep. uh, and she's a trained nurse, but she's not a trained doctor, yep. medical doctor. So it's gonna be interesting how this That'll be interesting to hear what happens, Richard. Um, that's great. Well, um, yeah, I haven't had a response back from James Molino yet, which is interesting. Um, yeah, but I did. Yeah. And it, and it wasn't, you know, I had an initial response and then I got a follow-up response that yeah. I haven't initiated, yeah. so I think it's been Okay, good. so what we're doing with our initial letters that we're going out, we're not trying to prove anything, we're not trying to make any claims, um, any kind of legal claims or anything like that. We're not trying to even present a whole lot of evidence. We're just simply saying what our concerns are, what are you doing to support me? These are, these are elected representatives, or in the case of telcos, um, you can say I'm in fear of what of harm from the technology that you're rolling out. That's basically all you need to say, because you'll get the same standard response back. What that th then does is puts them in a position of liability. All right. And then we can move into a process where we can try and make that liability stick a little, a little stronger to them, and and hopefully elicit some action like we saw on the Gold Coast. It's not the end of the story for Gold Coast. They're still considering um, the proposal, so we'll see what happens. But I think they're probably just delaying to see what actually their liability situation is. Um, but if we're approaching everyone from that point of view, that in our mind we come in peace and innocence, we ask questions, but what we're really doing is leading them into a situation where they're going to say, uh, let's all rely on the up hands of standards. And of course we know they don't exist, yeah. all right? So, like, if we do end up getting um, these corporations, politicians, where decision makers, yep. individuals, yes. we come at them from peace and innocence, actually making a stand and saying, oh, we go by our plans and stand, yep. therefore they're accepting liability themselves. Yep. So, it, it is, so, what if we do get a bunch of those letters? Okay. What happens? Yep. Well, I'm holding a bunch of those now. <laughs> what we're doing is, is doing a bit of a round table. Paul's actually just drafted a notice of liability. Um, the notice of liability process, if you haven't looked at the InPower videos, you won't really know what we're talking about. But basically it's a, it's a, an, a legal notice that they've developed. Um, probably legal's the wrong term, but I'm not gonna go into that. But uh, it's, um, it's in contract law. Uh, um, it works in the commercial realm. It's not common law or this sort of stuff people are talking about. It's simply working within the commercial law realm. Um, it's, it's like a commercial lien process, if you understand that. Um, and 
So we're trying to develop that for the Australian environment according to uh, uh, Australian rules. In, in power, I've done one uh, for the Canadian system and it's been very effective. They're sending it off to politicians, people in, at, the, at the heads of corporations and people in political power and a lot of these people are resigning within the next day or a few, a few days. They're literally resigning their positions. Um, and with that notice of liability letter, is it something, let's just hypothesise that this whole room was already, we, we got the response from our letter that said go refer to our hands, that's so we're all mm -hmm. ready to go. Yep. Is it that every individual does a notice of liability and then one main person submits it? No. If, well, Every, everybody should yeah. one word. So Paul's got a draft there. Um, if you're interested in that, maybe catch up with Paul afterwards. He's got a few copies. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I really want to wind up. Um, but yeah, that's the next step in the process. And perhaps get yourself on the email list and we can update you as we, as we move along. But get those letters out. And they don't need to be comprehensive or anything like that. Just get them out. Tell people what you're feeling, what you're in fear of. Ask some questions, all right? Mm -hmm. Okay, great.